In this video, we're going to boot Altair DOS version 1.0. We're going to demonstrate some of its commands and some of its features. Now, Altair DOS was announced in late 1975 at about the same time that the Altair floppy disk system was introduced into the marketplace. And Altair DOS was going to fill an important hole that MITS had in the Altair product line. At this point, there was no standard or easy to use way for users to develop assembly language programs or programs that would run in the 8080 processor's native machine code. The only way to really use the computer was with BASIC. Now, the BASIC packages on the Altair were done very well, and they supported all the latest hardware that Altair or MITS would introduce. However, they really needed, going forward, a way to allow people to assemble code into 8080 machine language to take advantage of the great increase in speed that would give. It would also allow compilers like Fortran and COBOL and things that other small business users were starting to clamor for. Now unfortunately, even though they knew the importance of Altair DOS and they worked on it, it was almost two years after they announced they were going to have it till it actually shipped. It was August of 1977 before Altair DOS actually started shipping. And by then it was frankly too little too late because another operating system that we're all familiar with, CPM, had really gotten a foothold and was becoming very popular in the marketplace. And on top of that it was easier to use, much more flexible, and it ran on pretty much every computer. It was getting ported to all sorts of different hardware. So CPM, CPM really became the operating system um, that took the microcomputers and personal computers into the next generation of computing. But Altair DOS is still interesting from a historical standpoint, so we're going to spend a few videos here getting familiar with it. All right, so to boot Altair DOS, it's just like all the other disk-based programs. We're going to reset the computer here. Go to the disk boot loader ROM, which is at 177400. We'll examine that location. That gets us into the disk boot loader. But before we boot, we have to tell Altair DOS what type of serial port our terminal is hooked to. These four bits tell it that we're hooked to a 2SIO port. All right, at this point we can run it and let Altair DOS boot. All right, that's complete. If we look here at our screen, we get uh, the kind of prompts we're used to seeing with BASIC. Oops, sorry about the fingers. All right, we'll just hit return and let Altair DOS size it. All right, it's asking if we want interrupts. Um, if you have wired the interrupt line on your serial board into the processor's interrupt line, then you definitely want to enable interrupts here because this gives you the ability to re-grab control from programs that may have gone astray or frankly some of Microsoft's code, for example their Fortran compiler, the only way to exit it was with a control C which could only be picked up by using the interrupts um, or hitting reset on your front panel. So yeah, if you had the interrupts enabled for the serial port it was a good idea to enable them here. Highest disk number we're just going to use one disk. Again, they start at zero, so zero, one, two, for example. So our highest disk number is just zero. How many files? This is the same questions that we had in basic, and we'll just put four in for both sequential and random, just to make sure that we have enough um, file blocks to open as many files as we ever might mess with. All right, the prompt for Altair DOS is a dot, and even though the commands are different, you'll see a lot of parallels to disk basic. To look at a directory of files, it's DIR, however, very ugly error messages tells you it didn't work. Why didn't it work? It's because we haven't mounted a disk. So the first thing we have to do is mount a disk. It's three letter command mount and then the disk number. This is exactly the same operation as the mount operation in BASIC. Once you've done it, we get our command prompt back, now we can do a directory which is the same as the files command. Now you'll notice I'm following these commands with a disk number. If you don't specify one, it'll always turn around and ask you for one. Alright, well there's a directory of files on the disk. You'll notice a lot of characters in front of a number of the files. This was used by Altair DOS. It wasn't required, but for a lot of things it was uh, assumed to identify the type of file. So the pound sign you see in front of programs, uh, some of the file names, those are executable binaries that could be loaded and run just as they are right now. If an AND sign is in front of it, that would be a source file like for the assembly language or Fortran program you might have written. A star in front of a file name, an asterisk, that indicates it's a relocatable, or not necessarily relocatable, it means it's an object file. 
Um, there's a couple more, but they're not really, I don't see any on here. The dollar sign is like a temp or a uh, backup file for the editor. Uh, percent sign might be a listing file. So those are some of the conventions Altair DOS used on file names. Now, Microsoft compilers like Fortran and, and their assemblers didn't follow those conventions, but they were available for, for Altair DOS, and we'll demonstrate some of those in the next video or two. All right, so there's several built-in commands in DOS that did not have to be one of these files. They're intrinsic commands, sort of like CPM does as well. DIR, mount, are, are two of them. Um, you could also rename a file. Uh, let's say here we got edit.tem. That's a temp file from the editor. Um, we can rename edit.tem and let's just call it test. See, I forgot to put in the zero, so it's asking me for it. And now you'll see that that edit.tem is called test. Now, by the way, as we do all this, Altair DOS only likes uppercase, and the delete key does the rub out style where it echoes the characters backwards until you get to the beginning of the line. All right, so um, the built-in command is delete to delete a file. So we could delete test by saying del test. And again, if you don't specify the zero, it's going to ask you for it. So now you'll see that the file test is gone. Um, a couple of the other built-in commands were one to load a program into memory but not execute it. For example, you could load anything with a pound sign in front of it because that's ready to run. You could also type run and then something with a pound sign in front of it and it'll run. For example, here's a program to display prime numbers. So we could say run prime zero. All right, now you'll notice, and I can abort it, Two or three things. Number one, I put the file number in. Number two, I did not put the pound sign in front of it. So it assumes the pound sign whenever you're going to run something that is a, considered to be an executable program. Also, the control C you noticed worked. If you did not have interrupts enabled, control C did not have the ability to regain control of that program. That program truly is loaded in memory and running on that CPU. It's got control of the CPU. All right, now a special case of programs allows you to increase the number of commands available to Altair DOS. So if a program is an executable program and it's on drive zero, which is basically all of these, you don't have to type run. I could just type prime. It's not an intrinsic command, so it goes to drive zero and looks for a program named prime with a leading pound sign. It finds it and runs it. Now if prime was on disk one or disk two, the only way to run it would have been to say run prime and then specify one or two, another uh, disk number out to the right. But if it's on disk zero, you can just type it in as a command. So some of the additional, let's call them standard commands that were available because they were added by Altair DOS would be the editor, which is on here. There's edit. So the editor is called edit. Um, very important program called cop, copy was actually a demonstration of how to use the editor, but it was really the only way to copy files around one by one, and so quite often you'll find that on an Altair DOS disk as well. So let's look real quickly at the editor. To edit a file, you type edit and then the file name. Let's, take, let's edit a program named echo. Now edit is going to look for a source file. It's going to find this one right here with the and sign in front of it, but you don't specify the and sign. Oh, I forgot the drive number, so it's going to ask me. All right, so that's the command prompt for the editor. P prints what it has in memory. All right, so that is the whole program. So that would be the source file echo. Again, you, source files you type without that because the editor assumes it's going to find the and sign. The line numbers are used a lot like basic just for the purpose of where to insert, how to delete, um, things like that. You don't jump to them because that has nothing to do with the software you're using. Uh, this is assembly language, it would not use these line numbers for anything except for editing. So for example, let's say I wanted to stick in a line between that semicolon and loop and define an equate that was the value 6. Because 6 is the SIO status register for the, um, for the cassette port, basically. And this program does an echo of anything that comes in the cassette port. So you could say insert a line at 115. So it's going to put it in right out of that semicolon for me. And I'll call this SIO status register and equate it to 6. And this is the SIO board status register. If you hit 
return, it goes back to the command prompt. Now I hit print, and you can see that now I've got a new line in there that is the SIO status register. All right, and then let's say I wanted to change 120 to refer to that instead of 6. Now there are editing commands, but it's hard to learn them and memorize them all. So you end up doing a lot of just deleting and replacing. I can replace line 120 and just type it in again. Loop in SIO status register, wait for a character. All right, now take a look at it. And you can see I replaced line 120, and now it's referring to the equate. All right, so you can do that kind of work, and you can type Q, will quit without saving anything, or you type E to exit, and that saves the file you just worked on. So now we look out here, and what do we have? Um, we still have our original echo, which is what we were working on. There should be a dollar echo in here somewhere. There it is. That's the version before we edited. So here's kind of your backup, and here's the new one. All right, um, let's see, what else? In, in this video, we'll demonstrate the copy command. Copy allows you to copy files, and it also allows you to copy files to devices and devices to files. And again, this wasn't really intended to be one of their commands originally. Uh, it was a demonstration of their software, um, and a lot of these and signs are part of this program, all linked together. So what copy does is it says, okay, where are we going to copy from? What is the input device type? It's either FDS, which stands for floppy disk system, which means a file. So we'll type floppy disk system. And the device number will be zero, which is the hard disk. File name, let's take a look at the, uh, the new echo, which will be and echo. Now this could be any file, so you have to tell it the leading character, because it doesn't know whether it's looking for a source file or an object file or an executable file. All right, set up output. Where are we going? Well, another option is to the screen, TTY. Device number, the main screen is zero, and you don't have to specify a file name. So what this is doing is copying the file we specified to the device we specified. So here's the program after we updated it. See, it's got our equate in it. And if we ran the same thing, input device is floppy disk system, device number is zero. This time we'll do the backup file. And the output device is the screen, and no file name needed. And here you see this is the one before we edited it. All right, and you can copy a file this way as well. So again, input is floppy disk system, zero, file name, let's copy the new file. Uh, no, that's not it. And the output device is also the floppy disk system. You could put a different floppy disk in at this point. And the file name is, um, let's call it, better put the and sign in front of it since we want to be consistent. All right. Now if you look, we should have a file called and sign test. You never know where it's going to end up. Oh, there it is right there. See, we could edit test. Again, we'll do it without the and sign because edit's going to assume that. And if you look at that, you'll see that is that original file. Oh, actually, no, it's the one we edited. All right, so those are some of the basic commands in DOS to allow you to get around. Uh, a little bit cumbersome, um, and it's not very uh, user-friendly. You saw the error messages. You know, it's pretty nondescript when I try to do a directory on a non-existent uh, floppy. But anyway, um, the next video is what we'll do is get this thing up and running and compile, or actually assemble a program and see how that works. And the video after that, we'll use Microsoft's Fortran compiler to see that you can actually get high-level programs. Um, up and running on this computer. All right, well that does it for this video. Now the computer used to do all this today is actually the Altair 8800 clone computer. This computer duplicates the look and the feel, the features, performance, and the limitations of a real Altair 8800, but it does it with modern hardware on the inside. And that makes the computer a bit more affordable and much more reliable so you don't have to worry about damaging a vintage or collector's quality computer when you're running all these fun exercises like we're doing. Be sure to visit AltairClone.com to learn more about this great computer so that you can experience all this uh, exciting period in computing history hands-on yourself.